All right, welcome to the six o'clock session. There's still people that are going to be filing in for this. Uh, but we've got, uh, you go by Kaylin or Kay, it doesn't matter. It doesn't really matter. I typically go by K. So. Kay Morissette, Louisville Cardinals. Yeah. Uh, she's going to be talking about controlling the draw, some tips, techniques, maybe a secret or two. Maybe, yeah. maybe. Maybe. Um, you know what? I'd prefer you give your own kind of uh, background and playing bio because there's a lot of it. I pulled it up real quick and I'm yeah. like, hey, <laughs> great I'll, accolade, uh, great teams, that kind of stuff. Yeah, I'll go through it. It's on my PowerPoint. All right, all right. Well, listen, um, I'm going to get my mug off here. I'm going to get you going uh, full. Um, take it away. Um, anybody okay. in the attendee box, throw your questions in the Q&A. Um, I'll filter those through to, to Kay, and, and we'll get started. Perfect. All right, so I'm going to share my screen quickly and share that. All right, so we're going to start from the beginning. All right, so... My name is Kay Morset. I am the assistant women's lacrosse coach at the University of Louisville. Um, and what we're going to be talking about today is controlling the draw. Um, you know, this is a part of the game that is constantly changing. Um, and it's really based on uh, your people's techniques and your own opinion, really. Um, so what I say today uh, might not be what you heard from, you know, John down the street. Um, but that's okay. And I'm just here to give you what we work on at the University of Louisville, what we um, as a staff believe is, you know, the best approach to the draw and, um, you know, what allowed me to be pretty successful um, throughout my career with uh, college and internationally. And just as a disclaimer, real quick, um, I know that I get questions constantly about um, draw sticks. Um, so none of this information that's going to be in uh, today's PowerPoint is um, centered around having a draw stick. Um, I like to think as the draw, a draw stick as a tool, not a necessity, but um, it's, it's nice to have. Um, but uh, like anything, even if you have a nice tool and you have no idea how to use it, it's not going to be very beneficial to you. So all these little techniques and these tips and these skills and um, certain traits that I'm gonna present is all before you get to a draw stick. Um, and I never had a draw stick growing, growing up, playing in college, even my first two World Cups. Um, and uh, now today when I train my girls, uh, we work all fall with minimal uh, areas with the draw stick until uh, a little bit later and then we start incorporating it and then they see how easy and how much of a good tool it is but we got to get up to that point so just a disclaimer nothing you need here is with a draw stick so quickly just a little bit of my playing and coaching career um, so I actually played uh, division one lacrosse at the University of Louisville right here um, from 2012 to 2016 it is absolutely one of my favorite places to be. Um, I love the city. I love the school. I love the atmosphere. And I'm so prideful to be a local Cardinal. Um, in, in my career, I was a three-time All-American, uh, my uh, sophomore, junior, and senior year, uh, three-time All-Regional player. So it's those same two, uh, three years and a four-time All-Conference player. So we were two years in the Big East and then two years in the ACC. Um, I only add this just to make sure you guys know that I feel like I am pretty qualified to talk about the draw. I rank third all-time leader for the draw controls in a career in the NCAA with 572. Um, I was second for a, quite a few years until last year. A uh, girl from Marist got 573, so kind of knocked me down a little bit, but that's okay. Um, and then all-time leader at the University of Louisville for most draw controls in a game season and career. Um, you know, and I tell my girls all the time, those are great stats to have. I'm very excited and very happy about those draw and, you know, those records. Um, but here my goal is for my girls to beat that because my, those numbers in a record book don't help us anymore. So that's where we stand on that. And then Team Canada, I've played uh, in 2011 in the U19. Team Canada went to uh, Hanover, Germany. We won bronze. And it's the first time I got to meet my boss, Scott Teeter. So I've known my boss since I was 13. Um, if you had tuned in to uh, the one last Friday. And then in 2013 and 2017, I also was a part of the senior national team, both winning silver and hoping 
crossing our fingers, uh, that I make it to the 2021 uh, next summer. That is a goal of mine. Um, coaching career, um, like I said, I've known Teeter since I was 13, so I made a pretty good relationship. So after college, I went straight to Canisius with him. Um, and uh, I was there for one season. We were MAC champions in 2017 and then got the phone call that uh, he got the head coaching job here at Louisville and he asked me to join him um, to be the offensive coordinator. So I've been here for three years. Um, and again, Coach Teeter being uh, uh, the head coach of the U19 team, Team Canada team uh, in 2019, I was his assistant coach. Um, so I owe a lot of my success and uh, a lot of my growth as a coach and even as a player to Scott Teeter. So always like to mention him. Okay, so what we're going over today, uh, we're gonna go over my philosophy of the draw. We're gonna go over stick and hands. We're gonna go over feet, where you should put your eyes and then wrist and stick work. All of these are can be as advanced or as basic as you wanna make them. Um, but again, a key thing to remember is that this is my opinion. Um, this is how I feel that this, um, how we contribute to the draw the best and uh, what I feel works uh, the best for us. Okay, so philosophy. The draw is the one area, is one of the only areas that you cannot control or you cannot always dictate. <coughs> I'm sorry. Um, you need to read the situation, understand what you're given and adapt accordingly. So things that you cannot can control. You cannot control your opponent, you can't control the officials and you can't control the circle people. When I say opponent, I mean, you can't control how much pressure they put, where they're trying to put the ball, if they're in their left hand, their right hand, if they're, you know, going to put, you know, where they put their feet, you know, where they're moving their players, you can't control any of that. So you're trying, you need to be able to adapt and be able to know different techniques for different scenarios. <coughs> excuse me officials so every official puts the ball differently in the ncaa in youth lacrosse in world lacrosse wherever you want wherever you go the officials are going to have a different um, approach to it so i find that in the ncaa the co uh, officials put the ball really close to the lip of the stick so you need, need to be able to adapt to that in world lacrosse or in international play, I feel that they put pretty close to the middle or even sometimes dead smack on top of each other. So you need to be able to control that. Not every official is gonna let you reset or restart. They're not gonna restart the draw just because you don't like where it's placed. You might get that once a game, maybe twice, but they're gonna get pretty, pretty over it pretty quickly and gonna say it's completely fine. So you need to be able to adapt to that. And then lastly, the circle players. So you can't control, <coughs> sorry, you can't control um, what they do or where they go. If they're trying to box out your girl, if they go behind you, in front of you, you have no, no control. So how do you understand these scenarios? Reps after reps after reps. I can't stress enough that the draw is more about how much you practice it rather than what you know. If you don't, I can give you all the tips and tricks possible, but if you do not practice, you will not be good at it. So. A good example is that my uh, freshman year, I probably got about 68 draws. And, you know, I wanted to be great. I wanted to be good at it. I wanted to be better. And so I studied, I talked to different mentors and one of them being, being Dana Doby. So that summer was World Cup in 2013 that I got the privilege of playing. And I was able to pick her brain and see why, where she puts the draw, why she does things, different drills for her that she works on and how she got so great. So I went from 68 draws to about 180, just from putting in the work. All right, <clears throat> sorry. All right, three keys to remember when it comes to stick and hands. Top hand, bottom hand, pressure, and quickness. So we're gonna go to the first one. This one seems pretty standard and something that most people know, but sometimes it's not. So. On the left side, you see the do. You do want to put your stick as close to the top of the, the stick head as possible. If you can touch it, that's great. Not every official is gonna let you, so just be, war just be warned about that. But the closer to the top of the stick head you can get, 
the more control you're gonna have. The next uh, picture below is um, just barely touching it. So being um, to the top of the stick and just grazing the plastic. Um, this just allows you to have more control, able to focus your pressure and be able to put it where you want. The second or the last picture on the don't side, you do not wanna see your shaft. You do not wanna see any of your shaft. You have no control, you have no pressure. You are not able to put the ball where you want. And it's just gonna be, you know, kind of, you're out of control. So <clears throat> basically what you wanna do is try to get as close to the top as possible and try to limit li or limit the amount of stick that you see um, when it comes to your hands. The bottom hand, what you want is parallel to your uh, to your waist. So on the do side, you see Monica, and I should shout Monica out. This is uh, one of my old teammates. She is two years older than me, so I played with her for two years. And she is currently trying out for Team Puerto Rico. So we train a lot together. We, um, throughout this quarantine, you know, always staying six feet apart, but not touching the same thing. But we've been doing uh, something called lax cardio. So uh, she was pretty excited to do stuff about the draw. So she was able to help me out. So this is Monica. She's great. Um, and you'll see her throughout the PowerPoint. But, you know, Monica, uh, Monica here, you see that her on the do side, her stick is parallel. She is um, looking at the ball and her on the first picture you see her hand at the bottom of her stick and why she has it at the bottom of her stick is to be able to get the bar ball far from the other opponent so typically when you see this this is because they're trying to get it out of the circle they're trying to use the momentum of their stick what she's going to do she's going to push the bottom hand down that will allow the top of her hand to come up and then she's going to whip it out of the circle the next one beside it is uh, choking up on the stick. And this typically shows me that the person is trying to get it to themselves. So less stick, a little bit quicker mo momentum, that's gonna allow the ball to go shorter and not as high and as far, and she'll be able to self-draw and be able to run out of it. So these are the two ways that you can hold your stick, um, but always wanting to make sure that they're parallel. The next is the don't side. And um, I see this sometimes with international play is keeping the stick really high up because what they're trying to do is use all their momentum to pull it down um, and get it out of the circle. But what I find with this, it takes too long to get from here to the bottom and you kind of just lose sight of the ball, lose track of it, and you won't be able to find it. Um, it's really tough to do and to master, and it's uh, not something that I encourage. So again, keeping it parallel. And the next one is being below your waist. Now in international play, you are allowed to do um, 30 degrees up or 30 degrees below your waist. And this can be an advantage sometimes if you're a very finesse player, but when you're teaching the draw and trying to uh, teach a younger player or someone who has never taken the draw, this is a really hard skill to do because you're already at a compromised position and there's really hard to get a lot of power out of there because you're already so low. So this, this position is more for someone who has taken the draw for years <clears throat> and it's something that I still don't do very often. All right, so this is probably one of the most important slides and probably one of, not, not the best kept secret because it's something I preach all the time, but it's where do you put your pressure? Now, if you were to put your pressure right dead smack, full on at, on a, another opponent's stick, <clears throat> you're basically saying, here's the ball because as soon as the, the whistle blows, that person's gonna open up. You have so much momentum that you're just gonna push the ball into their stick. So what i say to younger players or even my girls and this is the first couple of weeks that they come back to school you know we work on focusing our pressure at the bottom of our stick and we do that because yes your first motion has to be up but we want it to be also that you're turning your stick here while you go up to um initiate that ball rolling into yours it's a it's a tough skill to master just because a lot of times you see players doing this like their first motion pushing which is illegal so you have to go up and push and pull it out 
a way to initiate this skill is by doing it against something that doesn't move, right? So what doesn't move is a pole or a goal, a goal or whatever you can find, a tree trunk for anything, whatever you can find that doesn't move, this is a really great drill to focus on uh, tilting your stick and pulling up and away and getting that ball away from the pole. Um, so this is Monica and you'll see myself doing it as well. But basically what happens is that if the ball, if you were to just pull it up, the ball wouldn't go anywhere. It would skid like across the pole and you'd probably lose it underneath or it wouldn't go where you wanted it. So it really makes the draw person have to focus on putting pressure at the bottom, tilt their stick, push their bottom hand down and turn their top hand and pull it out. And you can put it anywhere other than straight into the pole, but you can place it and you can work on different placements. So I'll just play the clip quickly. So Monica's going off my whistle. I turned off the sound just because we didn't need it. But every time Monica's gonna put it in a different spot, so she's gonna post up, she's gonna lean and then use the bottom to get it away from the pole, pushing up and out. Here I am just pushing it forward, trying to show that you can put it anywhere you want and you just run onto it and you just finish the drill. So here, putting it right behind me, following it, tracking it, running onto it. So again, this is really good to work on putting pressure at the bottom because that's the only way you're gonna get the ball away from your opponent, which is the post. So we can go over that. Okay, the last thing to do with hands is quickness. Now, a way or a reasoning for this is because, and this is gonna be a, uh, the next or the next topic or the one after, is because we look at the ball, right? We're looking at the ball, we wanna track the ball, so the re what we're listening for is the whistle. So in this clip, you're gonna see Monica just pretending to be against an imaginary draw person. And all she's gonna do is hear that whistle and just try to move her hands as fast as possible, right? This is gonna work on you know, listening for the whistle, moving when the whistle is blown and making sure you don't have that self start because you don't see the wrath coming here and then moving her hand, you only hear it. So here, like this. So every time she's moving, she hears a whistle. So it's like tweet, she goes, moves, and there she goes. So you can see her looking at her stick, trying to follow where her stick head is going. Um, and a really good key as well is that wherever your stick head is pointing is typically where the ball is gonna go. So I always encourage <clears throat> my players to watch their stick head in this, um, in this drill. Again, this was Monica's um, first time doing it. So a little bit um, not as polished as I would hope but you know in a perfect world she would be here pulling the ball kind of moving her head and then setting back and the way we work on quickness and discipline in this drill is by slowing down the whistle in between the whistles speeding it up so that your player doesn't get into a rhythm because it might go like tweet 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 and if you pause and they automatically go because they're in that rhythm, we don't want that, right? We want them to be here, listen for the whistle, react quickly, and then reset, and then wait for that whistle and then react quickly. So that's quickness. <clears throat> All right, for feet. Kaylin, I just yep. had a question pop in. Um, does pressure mean at the bottom hand or the bottom of the stick head? Bottom of the stick head. That's a good question. So bottom of, so your top hand, bottom of the stick head. Yep. So that um, putting pressure at the bottom of your stick would actually um, kind of make you go sideways, which you have to be parallel with the line. So that's something you don't want to do <clears throat> just because you don't want to encourage stick displacement. Um, you wanna practice being as parallel as possible. So if you're putting a lot of pressure on your bottom hand, you're gonna be going sideways and that's not what we want. So pressure all at the top hand and you're putting pressure at the bottom of your stick. All right, best foot forward. So again, feet. So we're gonna talk about dictating, boxing out and keep moving. So just always moving our feet. 
All right. Dictate. Your feet may tell the opponent where you're trying to put the ball, and that is okay. So in college, one of the biggest things that I always heard was her feet are forward. She's going to push the ball. Like, everyone go there. Or her feet are square. She's going to pull the ball. Like, everyone go behind her, right? And that's a huge compliment. I loved it. But just because you know where I was going to put it doesn't mean you're going to get it. So some questions that I get a lot is what's the difference between pulling and pushing? Now, if you were to talk to someone like Taylor Cummings or talk to um, Marie McCool, who will all play for Team USA, they would probably say that pushing is being in your right hand going towards your attacking side and pulling is being in your left hand and going towards your defensive side. Some people switch. I, however, have always been a, I'm a righty, but my dominant hand, I write with my left. I throw a ball with my left. So the bottom hand of my, when I'm on my right hand is my dominant hand. So I like to try to keep my draw in my right hand as much as possible. So when I say pulling, that means I'm going towards my defensive side. When I say pushing, that means I'm going towards my offensive side. <clears throat> And why this matters is because it matters how you put your feet. So when I say square, and you're gonna see a picture of what I mean by square, because it's sometimes a difficult thing for people to kind of understand. When I say square, both my feet, my toes are pointing at my opponent. My left foot is gonna be touching the line, just the side of it. And then my right's gonna be extended a little bit so that I'm pulling the ball to my right able to push off with my left and then step with my right and box out with my left foot. So I'm kind of turning to the side, grabbing the ball and going. So that's what square means. Now, some girls like to have square as in their foot, left foot's forward and their right foot's back. Um, it just really it depends what your draw person is comfortable with. But typically when I'm pulling the ball, I'm going towards my defensive end, I'm pulling my stick to my right shoulder. I'm going to be opening up my hip going towards my defensive side and I want to be able to push with my left foot to explode out of that movement and be able to get the ball. When I say toward attacking side, outside foot touching the line. So that means I'm more looking at my offensive restraining line. So my attacking side, I'm literally putting my stick on my left toe is touching the line. My right foot is back because as soon as I hear that whistle, I'm going to be pushing that ball forward, stepping all my weights on my left, stepping with my right to box out my opponent and running onto my running onto the ball. So I'm trying to uh, initiate a lot of momentum, pushing with my stick with the bottom, guiding it towards my attacking end, and then I'm able to run onto it, boxing out my girl. So when my feet are my toe is touching the line, that's typically um, that's pushing. <clears throat> and then the last one that you see a lot of lefties doing more than right-handed players, but another one that you can do is toes to the, both toes touching the line. And what that means typically is that you're getting, trying to get the ball to the 50. Um, so both toes are touching the line. You're very square. Like your shoulders are pretty much facing your, um, either restraining line. Again, like I said, a lot of lefties, if you're taking it left-handed, this is what a lot of people do. You touch, both toes are touching the line, you're in a squat, you're here, and as soon as the whistle blows, you're using the bottom of your stick to turn and you're pushing and you're put it, putting it right to the 50, right behind you to run onto. As a right-handed player, it did work sometimes, but a lot of times I was able to just push it forward, but this is also another technique. So when, um, you're teaching your younger players, you know, different ways to take the draw, focus on your feet for them to know where to place the ball. And that's a really good starting ground um, and how to place the ball or at least have the intent of placing the ball. And so when you're teaching a younger player, if you're here and you see their toes pointing forward, like they're gonna push towards their attacking end and it doesn't go there, you can ask them, why do you think that didn't happen? Well, a lot of times when you go over it, you know, girls can say, well, I didn't put enough pressure on my bottom or, you know, I let them pull my stick back. So I wasn't able to go forward. Right. And it's a little bit of a good talking cue and it's a good way to start, you know, 
and uh, you know the initial you know trying to place the ball rather than just taking the draw and trying to rip it out of the, the circle all right next one boxing out and keep moving so boxing out i feel is pretty self-explanatory <clears throat> whenever you're one one-on-one -on, -one on someone you always want to try to get the advantage and that's why with your feet it's really important to understand where you're trying to put the ball and where your feet are placing so that you can try to box them out once you get that get that draw control so a really good um, drill that we use for boxing out is setting up four corners of just a little box put a ball right in the middle and you just kind of ditch your sticks and get your girls to set up like they're going to box each other out blow that whistle it's whoever can get that ball and box out the other person and win that ball um, i find with women's lacrosse a lot girls don't want to be touched and they're really timid and they don't they're you know don't want to get bruises and unfortunately if you're going to be on the draw or you're going to take the draw you're gonna get touched and you're gonna get hit and you have to understand how to deal with it um so again boxing out is key so that anytime you have a draw person um, taking the draw always think of uh, placing and how do you get your body in front to get that advantage so just always trying to swing that leg in front to show your back to get that ball trying to run ahead um, and be able to secure and just make sure that person is behind you um, and then keep moving so again if you get the draw you have the ball so anytime that you have the ball there's gonna be people coming after you so the biggest no-no when it comes to the draw is when they stop and just they're like I got it that's great you want to encourage them to keep moving so you're gonna see a drill and I'll point it out and so a couple slides away but you're gonna see a drill where um, it's reacting and tracking and then I take three or four steps after I catch that ball to make sure that I am always trying to move my body and move forward anytime I have that ball. Um, I had a really bad tendency, you know, my freshman year of college of just being really pumped when I got it and I would just kind of stop and then everyone would swarm me. And this is a time where too, as soon as the whistle blows, everyone from the restraining line also could come over. So you had, you know, 10 plus people coming at you and you just have to you can't be you know a deer in headlights you got to keep moving so you got to encourage them anytime they have that ball and they win it out of the air to just keep going all right eye on the prize which is the ball so this is another technique of mine that may not you may not have heard of or you may not may not initially agree with me but I find that I have so much success when I watch the ball and I track the ball rather than looking at the ref. And um, the reasoning is because I false started all the time when I looked at ref because I kept trying to anticipate when they blew the whistle and it never worked. So this is um, just a picture of me playing uh i think it's against boston college and this is my square stance so going back to the last topic with your feet so this is what i mean my left foot has all my weight on it my right foot is there ready to be propelled and pushed forward by my left when i try to get it into this area right here i don't know if you can see my mouse kind of going here but that's where i'm trying to get the ball but this is more looking at my eyes. So I'm looking at the ball, ready to track it and then react. And why we do this is again, like I said, to try to stop the self starting and also to be able to find the ball, even if we win or lose it. And I found that when I looked at the ref or even when my girls look at the ref, their whole body turns, right? So they're turning away, especially if the ref is behind them, they turn away, they hear that whistle, they go, and they have to try to find it in the air rather than staring, waiting for that anticipation, ready ready to go. They're all their pressures at the bottom of their stick. And as soon as they hear that whistle, they're turning, it's super quick, and they're pulling it to their, their right or pushing it to the, to the attacking. And I just found that it had more success because even if I lost it, I still had a step forward because that Boston College girl, you know, was staring at the ref, had to find it in the air, and I'm already taking off because I've already tracked it and I already found it. So 
I encourage a lot, all my girls to watch the ball, to stare at the ball. And I actually find that a lot of girls are much more comfortable with this. And we see a lot of success because they're able to find it even when um, they lose it. So this just takes a little bit of practice to get used to. Again, that quickness um, really helps um, starting that. And then the next drill that when it comes to track and react, so this is a drill that the assistant coach, um, so that's me, uh, my assistant coach was there. She had a whistle. Anytime she blew the whistle and threw the ball, I had a track, I had to react, and I had to move forward to go get it. So this is me uh, practicing keeping my eye on the ball. Even if I think it, you know, I'm set up to go for it to go in front, even if it goes behind me, I can track it and still go on and go get it. So this is a really great drill to work on that tracking and reacting. So always making sure you move forward. So ball goes wherever. I'm looking for it to go. You see my head pop up. I find it. I time the jump. So every time my eyes are trying to find the ball and then I'm moving forward, trying to get out of any scenario that I made up in my head. I'm a very visual person. So I think every time I took a draw, I'm like, oh, there's two people coming and I got to move. Um, a good way to do this too is to have do the same drill and have a player coming on, right? So not always taking the draw is going to make you, you know, great at, um, you know, this sort of stuff. But if you can initiate, you know, that tracking, that reacting, and that moving forward, you're going to have success at any level and wherever you put the ball. Okay. All right. And the last part that we're going to talk about is wrist and stick work. <clears throat> And why this is important, it's because you can do all of the hard work, you can do putting the pressure at the bottom of your stick, you can track the ball, you can react to the ball, but if you can't catch the ball, or if you can't control the ball, all your hard work goes to nothing. So three thing keys to remember, hand-eye coordination, <clears throat> single arm stick work, wall ball or with a partner, and then wrist and grip strengthening. So the first one, hand-eye coordination. This is honestly, I get a lot of the drills that I do with our girls from our goalie coach, Renee. Um, you know, just so many different ideas and different things to incorporate. Um, we, this, uh, this season, got a Hiko, I think I'm pronouncing it right, Hiko stick, um, and you can get it off Amazon. They're not too expensive. And what this is great for is um, it's really great to throw and then they have to track it and then find the color that you called. So if I have it in my hand, I throw it up and I say red, my girl now has to look up, track it, move her feet and get and try to catch the red one, the red side of it. Um, it worked out so good and um, you know, a couple coaches were super impressed that we had it in our indoor facility and our football coach, um, our running back coach, actually saw and asked to borrow the two that we had, and we still haven't gotten them back, so I may have to buy my buy two more. Um, but it's good for any type of skill, hand-eye coordination. Um, we do this with our circle people as well to really anticipate and time their jumps or their in boxing out. The other thing that you can do is, and for an advanced player, is to actually have them turn their back. So, and then you throw it up, call a, num uh, a color, and then they have to turn, track it, find it, and then grab the blue side, whatever one you called. Um, I really, really love that. And I actually got my little cousins on it, so they're loving it. And then if you can't get your, a hand or a hold of one of those, colored balls are also your best friend. So any hand-eye coordination, you have two different colors in your hand. If you have green and blue, you throw both up. And you say blue, they have to find the blue one. And it's just really making sure that, um, you know, they're tracking and being able to catch that ball. And again, with these, you have your stick in your hand, you have every, your, tool, uh, your stick, you want to make sure you encourage finishing the play. So once you, they get that blue ball, you have to run out, right? Two or three steps, finish the play. So always encouraging, making it as game-like as possible um, with all of your drills. Um, Okay, next is stick work. Love stick work. I, I am washed up athlete and I still do wall ball just about every single day just cause I love it. It's one of my favorite things. So um, I 
can brag about this a little bit. I think I can catch a ball just as well in my one, with one hand than I can with two. Um, I have a lot of control and it comes with a lot of practice. Um, all wall ball and partner passing routine should incorporate one handed stick work. Um, so both passing and catching. So you should be able to catch that ball out of the air, bring it back and be able to throw it with one hand. Um, just being able to catch a ball in a compromised position or when your body's in a compromised position is so beneficial and so key because then you just get a better opportunity of winning that ball. And this can be started when they're little, little to, you know, my girls know that all the girls that take the draw, they are required to do this every single time. Um, catching bad passes. So in the next slide, you're going to see a drill that you'll really understand what I mean, but being in one hand and catching it low off stick and be able to make a play out of that is key, you know, is, you know, being able to catch a, again, catch a ball in a compromised position or being confident that you can will give you such an advantage and be able to, you'll have more possessions. And then the next one that I want to, you know, really, uh, encourage is coming over top of the ball. <clears throat> so what I mean by that is not just sticking your stick out like a pancake and hoping that you get it and hoping that you can run away with it. If you come over top of the ball, you're initiating a cradle. So when you come here, you're actually, it's kind of like a cradle. So you're here, you come over the top and you can bring it right into your shoulder for a quick pass. If you're pancaking it and you're like this, trying to, trying to pick it up or trying to catch it, you're one extended way too far. You have no control and it's really hard to cradle like this. So you want to come over the top, bring it up and pass it out. And that was something that I think was taught for me by box lacrosse. And, you know, I grew up playing box with the boys and um, coming over top of the ball was so, so like drilled into our heads um, that you never wanted to catch like this because you were just going to get your stick checked. So same in the women's game, coming over top, bringing it in and then passing that ball. Um, passing and catching on the move. So again, you're, you know, very few times in lacrosse, you're going to be standing still. So, you know, throwing the ball up and jumping and catching on the move, or when you're running uh, forward, passing it behind you with one hand, all super beneficial. Just incorporate into your stick work, um, you know, daily. And then being able to control the ball and bringing it back to your body. So again, coming over top and being able to bring it in quickly, or being coming from the side, bringing it in quickly, you want want to encourage that catch and bring in catch and bring in because the more lo the longer that your stick is hanging out by itself the more of a threat it is to to get checked and then get creative um i think you know we are always scared we want to figure out the basis first but if we get creative like you know throwing a one-handed flip you know coming around doing a behind btb or around the world um you know anything to be creative with your girls will encourage good like good stick skills and you know again when they're put into a compromised position they'll be confident enough to throw a good pass or be able to recognize what they need to do um and the last one is just a fun one a 360 so you come over top of the ball you're here you bring it around your back and then you're back into two that's one that i honestly learned from just listening to my coach coach on the sideline and i was just kind of fiddling around and then i just kind of learned so just encouraging creativity is awesome so this is a, a wrist work um, drill that you can do. So I learned this from uh, Dana Doby. I think it is by far one of my favorite drills and it incorporates so many of our key things. Tracking, reacting, movement, um, one-handed stick work, catching the ball in compromised positions, bringing it into two hands, and then you do it into a shot. So your back is to the goal, you're gonna be in one hand, your partner's gonna toss it up and put it different spots. And then you're gonna come over top, bring it in, turn around, shoot. And then you're gonna set back uh, right away. So we're here, Monica threw me a ball, came over top, came back, shot. Here, up top, always coming over top, that was down low, bringing it in quickly, coming here, being creative, you know, just encouraging them to keep moving and to keep, you know, catching the ball one-handed, catching it down low, coming in, bringing it in close. And then I won't show you, we did it with the other side of the wrist, not as good at it, still need to work on it, but you do it in both wrists, you do it in both hands. And then another way, if you have a little bit more of an advanced player, actually starting facing the goal so that when they hear go or the whistle, they have to turn around, track the ball, catch the ball, and they're 
just, it is, it's like the post drill um, that we showed at the very beginning. There's just so many key elements. It touches on so many different things that I think this is just a great drill to incorporate all the time um, and something that honestly we do almost every other day. All right, and just grip work. So this is in the weight room. If you're fortunate enough to be able to be in the weight room, um, this is something that I encourage to do. This is kind of what took my game to a little bit of a, 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 a neck, the next level. And then what my, our draw girls here at Louisville, they do this for extra work um, and they do these all the time. So this again, features a much younger K, much more in shape, much more, uh, a little bit blonder. Um, but this here, anything to compromise your grip. So a towel, this is a reverse uh, row. Um, so here, anything to pull, like to just make your grip compromised um, will be really beneficial. And then the last one, or not the last one, but the next one is plate flips. Um, you know, getting a plate and this I think was 10 kilos and just doing it as many times for as long as you can until fail, again, is really making your fingertips um, be able to, you know, be in different, uh, difficult situations, you know, you have cramping, but this just makes your grip on your stick so much stronger, your wrist so much stronger, you're able to bring in your stick and it just translates to the field like crazy. Nope. Then the last two, again, more grip work, um, just around the world. Um, here, those are two, uh, 10 pound plates that are just faced together and you just bring it around again to compromise the grip. And then here is a rice bucket. This is a oldie but a goodie. And this is again to get those wrists turning, to get them to come over top. I feel like this really helps with that motion of coming over top and being more comfortable and more, um, you know, just it makes it easier. And then this adds a lot of stress to your wrists. So that when you put your stick in your hand, it feels light as a feather and easy, easy, easy. And then that's all I got for you guys. So again, we went over, you know, uh, you know what your stick in your hand should look like, your eyes, your feet, and your grip work, grip and stick work. You know, all of these are going to contribute to your to your players' lacrosse game. Um, but like I want to preach, like I said before, just because you have these, if you don't practice, you don't, uh, you know, preach the same, um, you know, same things over and over again, you know, you're not going to see results. So, you know, my girls get really frustrated with me because I make them do it over and over again. But I'm like, we got to do it so that when it comes to this situation, you're prepared. Um, and practice makes perfect. So, uh, you know, I hope this was beneficial to you guys. And if you guys have any questions, all my contact is there. I mean, I love talking lax. It's my fave thing. And I got all the time in the world. So um, just, you know, email me and it's, uh, we can chat. <laughs> you gonna take some questions now yeah love right. questions um what age would you first start teaching the draw and this is two parts so that's part one part one i mean there's always going to be a draw right at every game so i think you know as young as you can get them i think just just the bare minimums of like how to place their feet, you know, the pressure on the stick is, is key, you know, to keep their hand really high. So as, as soon as they start taking draws and, and games, that's when I would start. So I guess it would be uh, middle school or like fifth or fourth or fifth grade. Um, but things like one handed stick work can be done when they're babies, um, you know, just incorporating all that stuff and you just gradually make it, you know, increase in volume and increase in, in toughness. And, and so I would say as young as you can get them um, is key. That's good. Second part, what are some ways to make that um, fun for the younger players? I, I know there's some games that you can play off of that, but I'll let you, I'll let you I go. Mean, anytime. I mean, I found, I coach. So one thing I joke around with is like the, the little babies. I just, am like, I can explain a couple ways, but I don't, you don't get it. I'm like, okay, anyone want to help me out? But I think if you can make anything like a game, like if you don't call it a drill, I found like, if you call it a drill, they're like, this is bad. Like this kind of sucks. If you can call it a game, um, you know, I would, I would make it like that. So first I would start with just a one handed ground ball. Again, we don't want to like, encourage one-handed ground balls all the time but if you want to start working on um, one-handed wrist work starting with a ground ball so 
One that I love is like hungry, hungry hippo. So when you have all the balls in the middle and they're all at different ends and they run in, catch a ground ball, and then they bring it out and then they keep going to whatever team has the most balls. That's a really good start. Um, and then honestly, line drills. So if you just have them as many people as you can, cause you want to keep them busy you want lines as short as possible. But even if you can just be here, there's with one hand and you just toss it, and you just encourage them to catch it. Like, perfect. Give me the ball back. And then you go back to the end of the line and you just keep going and going. Um, you know, those are always great, but again, calling things games and calling rather than drills are always, uh, something that I found beneficial. Um, but yeah, and I think you just, you got to keep it positive, right? You got to keep in just positive reinforcements and uh, just making sure that, you know, you make sure that they love it and you want to keep coming back and they're going to be frustrated and they're going to, you know, maybe tell mom and dad that wasn't very fun. But if you just keep, you know, bringing it up and encouraging them, they're going to always want to come and do back and do it. Yeah. I mean, the draw in itself is a game, right? I mean, you're, you're going head to head with someone. So I always it's a found within a game essentially. So, yeah. you know, I always thought it was one, you know, it's kind of like a moment in the spotlight for about five seconds because it's just, everyone is watching those two people. Right. So again, like I said, it's, it's all different scenarios. It's all different techniques. So it is a game within a game. Yeah. So yeah, if there's any questions, you can pop them in the Q and a box, but uh, Kay does have her contact information set in there. Um, one of the compliments, just one of the best presentations past two weeks. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Thanks guys. Sorry about my like throat. I had coffee not too long ago and it totally dried my throat out. I was like, Oh no, this is going to be miserable, but it worked out. We're good. So I got lots of oh, water. Great. Good video. Like the, it, it was good content. It, it kind of flowed oh, right along in terms of um, the videos as to the explanations. Yeah. I, I, sometimes the draw can be really foreign to a lot of people. So when I say square, like even when I show my kids, like this is what's square, they're like, how do you put your feet? So even me saying and me speaking and saying what I, I'm trying to, it's not, it, you need a picture, you need a video, you need something. So um, I'm a big visual person. So I figured my presentation should be like that too. So Wayne wants to know if there's a special tactic you would use when facing off against a much taller player. You want to get away from them. So the tactic that I would use is basically trying to initiate your circle people to try to go near them. Like, so if, I, if I'm up against whoever and she's six, two, I'm five, eight. So if she's six, two, and I'm like, if I even have put it just above me, she can just reach over and grab it. So I need to put it into space. So I'm going to try to put my circle people and hopefully their people follow, but again, you can't control it but you're basically going to try to put your people strategically somewhere and wherever they are, you're going to try to get it the other way and as far out so that you can run onto it. So you want to try to get it out, but not too far where a, a, a restraining line person can reach over and grab it, right? You want to just be able to push it, pull it away, pull it or push it away from them and then run onto it. So I always kind of think of like one bounce is perfect. So in that situation, you pull, it bounces once, and then you're able to come over top or scoop it out off the ground, and then you're, you're on your way. But you need to just put that ball into space and then just, uh, just keep going. Just run forward. Create space, create time. Yeah, and even, um, you know, I, I look back, I was watching a lot of film for this, and I was watching some of my old games. And my senior year, I played against Kayla Trainer and uh, – she was really good. She had a draw stick and I didn't, but you know, she was just so talented at getting the ball just in that perfect spot where I was just too far for me to reach. And my next tactic was, okay, so she is gonna put the ball there. I have to find a way to disrupt her pattern, right? So as I knew it was going there, so I just led with my stick and I just trying to nudge her arms or nudged her hands just so that her stick moved and at least there was a bounce and I had a chance, right? So being tactical and even just following because of your first motion just has to be up. If you just follow and then you're, you know, you're trying to disrupt, you know, hit their, tap their hands or, you know, you're trying to get your stick in the way, right? That might give you an advantage for a split second. 
Um, so just kind of reading, you know, if you have a person that's constantly putting it in the same spot, you just can't get it out. I mean, then encourage it. And then, you know, they're going to go there. So you're just going to run and t try to disrupt, um, their pattern. So the next question is what exactly do you mean by draw stick? Oh, hold on. I got a stick. Okay. So draw sticks can be, um, used it's it's mainly a stringing they manipulate the stringing so okay. that the ball sets sorry there's this plastic thing in here um the ball sets at a certain spot so this is our draw stick this is the gate stick and you can see here that there's little things in here that will try to manipulate the ball to encourage it to stay in your pocket and then the stringing is also very loose up here so that when it goes in the lip, it's going to want to hook against this lip. So a draw stick is essentially a head of a stick that's manipulated for this kind of stuff right here, or the stringing is manipulated to be able to, you know, catch the ball in certain positions, or it's looser on one side and tighter on the other so that the ball wants to drop. Um, and it's just, it's an advantage. But when two draw sticks go up against each other, it's kind of mute. But um, yeah, it's just, okay. you're looking at, and, uh, and a lot of times these sticks are manipulated in a way that you can't play with it normally. So that's when you start seeing people exchanging sticks, like a, a draw person exchanges with a, de a defender. And that's because they, wouldn't, they probably wouldn't be able to throw or catch with it or shoot very well because it's, it will hook and because the stringing is so loose. Gotcha. And, yeah. Okay. Well, I think we, we cleaned out the Q&A box. We'll give it a few more seconds if someone wants to pop something in. And other than that, they've got your your contact info out. Um, yeah. That was phenomenal. Really good job. Appreciate it. Oh, thanks. I, I appreciate it. And it's always fun. Again, I can talk lax all day long and I got the time. So yeah. here I am. Okay. Well, you know what? I don't see anything more coming in. Um, okay. I appreciate your time. Uh, thank you to both, you know, yourself and Scott um, reaching out. We've had some great great women's content over the last two weeks. Um, you, know, yeah. you know, and I just want to say thank you to you because uh, this is amazing. And this is, you know, something 10 years ago when, you know, I was a young coach or a young player, like player coach, uh, you know, this didn't exist. And this stuff, you know, and I hope that a lot of people take advantage of this and uh, learn. And I think, you know, quarantine has shown the best in lacrosse almost. Um, so I really appreciate you putting this on and uh, it's so beneficial for the lacrosse community. I yeah, well, okay. I've taken away just as much. I, I, I probably didn't buy enough paper. I filled up probably three notebooks, mm -hmm. and and uh, you know I've I've seen every presentation. So awesome. Um, by by the end of tomorrow, I think I'll be at forty seven, and Stamper helped me with a few as well. So that's um, awesome. Yeah, you know what? It's been great takeaways for myself. Um, but you, the the feedback I'm getting from others, especially especially the people that were new to the game, like I don't know how many emails and and. Uh, messages I received from someone that started to coach at U8, U10, U12, and they they really didn't know kind of what they were doing. And they said, you know, we've been able to put some practice plans and some strategies together so that when we do get on the field, you know, yeah. we feel like we're, we're away. So it, it's been tremendous that way. That's awesome. Yeah. Well, I appreciate everything you're doing. And yeah, you if too. you need another speaker, I'll gladly do it. All right. Well, that sounds good. Listen, you enjoy your Friday night. Thank you for taking your time with us. Uh, for everybody that's on, uh, we Chaz Woodson's made himself available. He's coming on to speak about uh, Nations Not United Lacrosse um, and and diversity in the game. So uh, you know, pretty pretty big hot button topic and one that Chaz is well well spoken on. So uh, that's coming up at eight o'clock, and that'll finish it off for the night. Okay. Thank you again, awesome. and uh, I'm sure I'll talk to you and Scott soon. Yeah, of course. All Stay right. safe, everyone. Thank you. Take care.